Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Buffalo Niagara Business Incentives. My name is Sarah Larson. I'm the Marketing Manager here at Invest Buffalo Niagara, the Buffalo Niagara Region's Economic Development Organization, and also the host of many past webinars where we focus on specific topics in economic development. Joining me are three presenters today. First, business expansion expert, Alan Rosenhawk, from our NBN offices. Alan focuses on national companies in the manufacturing and medical device industries, as well as startups that are considering an expansion. Alan's services are free of charge to any business interested in expanding to the Buffalo Niagara region. And our guest presenters today are Corey Van Dusen and Kristen Ray, both certified public accountants with Lumsden McCormick. One of many partners we often work with here at Invest Buffalo Niagara when a company is interested in expanding to the region. Corey has 15 years experience with a focus on business development incentives. And Kristen has been with Lumsden for a few years now, also working primarily with commercial entities focused on various federal, state, and local business development incentives. I really do have a dream team today for your topic of business incentives. Alan, Corey, and Kristen will walk you through opportunities available in Buffalo, Niagara, help you understand eligibility, and the application process. And if you still have questions, they can answer them at the end of this presentation. Before we begin today, a little housekeeping. If you do have questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. Following this presentation, you will receive an email with our latest business incentive guide, also with our contact information and a link to our website with expansion tools if that is something you may be considering. So now, without further ado, I will turn the presentation over to Alan and we'll get started. Thanks, Sarah. Great to be with all of you today. Thanks so much for joining us. Excited to talk about this topic that we cover with many of the companies we work with that are considering expansion, relocation, or establishing any sort of facility in the Buffalo Niagara region. So this is kind of our agenda for the day. We're gonna talk about a couple as of right incentives, the New York State manufacturers tax rate, 0% here in New York, the Excelsior Jobs Program, really the marquee business development incentive program for New York State, the investment tax credit, which is really interesting and sometimes underutilized. We're gonna talk a little bit about energy incentives and brownfields and the types of projects for which those can come into play and a federal workforce uh, incentive program, the Workforce Opportunity Tax Credit, also referred to as WOTC, we'll cover a bit at the end as well. Now, to help us with today's webinar and to make it a little more applicable, we're gonna use a couple hypothetical projects that we will refer to a couple of times throughout the webinar. Uh, the first is a larger project. We will see this company planning to construct a new facility of 200,000 square feet, manufacturing facility, they are projecting that they would create 200 new jobs over a five-year period. The average gross salary of those jobs would be $50,000 a year. And the project would, be, would spend about 42 million in capital investment, which as you see would be broken down about 15 million for new construction, 25 million for production equipment, and 2 million for other expenditures, furniture, fixtures, and non-production equipment. This company also would have a pretty significant power demand of uh, five megawatts at a peak load and would have a three shift operation, which would result in a pretty high load factor, which we'll talk about later as it relates to energy incentives. The second hypothetical is a smaller, medium sized project. This project would be leasing 30,000 square feet for a manufacturing facility, an existing building. They project to create 25 jobs over a five year period. Similar average gross salary of $50,000 a year, significantly lower capital investment, it's a medium-sized project, so $2 million, about 975,000 of that would be lease costs over a five-year term, a million dollars in production equipment, and 25,000 in ancillary expenditures as well. This project for our hypothetical situation would not have a significant power demand. Of course, they'd still be drawing uh, industrial commercial power rates, um, and, but they wouldn't have a major power demand. So we've set ourselves up 
and I'm going to throw it over to our experts, Corey and Kristen, to start off with talking about the New York State 0% tax rate. Thank you, Al. Uh, glad you guys are listening to our presentation today, too. Uh, I've been working in the incentive area for probably 10 or 15 years now and uh, have met some really neat companies uh, that we've helped either locate here in Buffalo or expand here in Buffalo, especially on the manufacturing side, because it's one of the targeted industries that uh, New York State is trying to attract either through uh, as of right incentives, meaning you are a manufacturer and you qualify, or some sort of application process like Alan talked about with the Excelsior Jobs Program. So uh, this this benefit that we're talking about here is pretty neat. Uh, I think it was passed in 2014-ish uh, uh, with the New York State budget. And if you are a C-Corp, uh, and you are considered a New York State manufacturer, uh, your corporate level income tax in New York State uh, is 0%. Uh, so here we have a slide with the legality of uh, what is a qualified uh, New York State manufacturer. Uh, basically, you have to be in a C Corp and over 50% of your gross receipts uh, need to come from a manufacturing process. You need to change something, cut something, and, and the actual verbiage is there uh, as well. And something interesting I always find is that um, uh, farming generally qualifies as manufacturing under tax law, both federally and New York State, because the federal government can have different uh, definitions uh, of things as well. Uh, there's also uh, a uh, tidbit in there if you have uh, activity inside and outside of the state, how you determine whether you're a New York State manufacturer. But generally, if you've got a manufacturing plant in the U.S. and you're a C-Corp, uh, you're going to have a 0% tax rate in New York State. Next, we have uh, the Excelsior Jobs Program. Uh, and this is also a definition uh, of manufacturing under the Excelsior Jobs Program. So. Uh, like I said before, New York State likes manufacturing. They want to incentivize uh, manufacturers to come to New York State, to grow in New York State, and to expand in New York State. Uh, this is a very, very similar de definition. Uh, and, and one thing I just wanted to point out here, while it doesn't say anything about that 50% requirement, on the back end, if you're a manufacturer that goes into Excelsior, uh, generally speaking, your revenue and your employees need to be 50% or more uh, involved in the manufacturing process. So you can't have 5% of gross revenue be uh, manufacturing, the other 95% be service and get into Excelsior under the manufacturing definition. Thanks so much, Corey. So we're going to talk a little bit deeper about the Excelsior Jobs Program. As I mentioned earlier, it's really the marquee program that New York State uses through its economic development agency, Empire State Development, or ESD, uh, to incentivize manufacturing companies and others uh, to grow and expand jobs in New York State. And the two credits within Excelsior that we see uh, leveraged by far and away the most um, in our projects are the jobs tax credit and the research and development tax credit. We're going to talk at length about both of those in a few minutes. But as far as eligibility goes, there are job minimums based on your uh, strategic industry in which you play. And so as Corey just mentioned, it's really about what is happening in the facility, in the majority of the jobs and the uh, property that you own. So here we're focusing on manufacturing, and I'm thrilled that the minimum job creation for a manufacturing project is really quite low. It's five jobs. That's over a five-year period. And so it started at 25. It started at 25, and they've yeah. lowered it. Yeah, when Excelsior first came out, it was at 25. Then they've lowered it to 10, and now it's down to five. I think it's really smart on, on behalf of the state, and it allows more projects. Uh, those singles that we really love here at Invest Buffalo and I, we love hitting singles and doubles because they really add up. Um, and so... Uh, you just have to create five jobs, uh, project to create five jobs over a five-year period to be eligible for the program. So we're going to get a little bit deeper into what the potential benefits are within Excelsior, and we're going to start with the R&D tax credit portion. Um, it mirrors the federal R&D tax credit law, and here Kristen is going to lead us through this. 
So I don't know if anyone is familiar with the federal research and development tax credit, but in general, in order to qualify for this type of credit, you need to be doing activities that meet this, what they call a four part test. So that four part test has to do with technical uncertainty, process of experimentation, uh, if it's technological in nature and that there's a qualified purpose to the activities that you're conducting. So in order to hit this four part test, um, with technical uncertainty, you're looking at, you know, is the activity performed to eliminate some type of technical uncertainty, you know, is using a different type of metal going to create a stronger product, something that you need to essentially test in order to figure out. It's not something that you're just going to know off the back of your hand. You have to have a process of experimentation. So essentially thinking back to the scientific method, you will have a hypothesis, you're going to test that, you're going to see whether it works or whether it doesn't work. Um, making sure it's technological in nature. So the process of experimentation has something to do with the hard sciences, whether that be um, biology, physics, engineering, anything of that nature. And then, like I said, just a qualified purpose. So the purpose of the activity is to create a new or improved product or process. So you want to enhance the product that you're currently manufacturing, or you want to come up with a new product, something of that nature. So the federal R&D credit is a wage-based credit. The majority of the expenses generally do come from your wages, and that's for work that is performed in the United States. Funded research is something that would not qualify, so you cannot receive funds from another um, company or entity in order to create a new product or essentially perform research on their behalf. That would not qualify for the credit. So a common thing here is uh, sometimes there's SBIR loans from the, or uh, grants from the federal government. Uh, you don't have any economic risk. You're, somebody else is financing your R&D. Uh, the level of technological advancement does not matter. So it is okay if it's just a slight improvement to a product. It's okay if it fails. It's honestly, it's great if it fails because it proves that you did have research and development activities that were being conducted. Also, reverse engineering is not something that would qualify because it's essentially just taking apart what someone else has already done. There are also, so the other portion of this credit is primarily going to be, so contract research is common and that's either 100%, 75% or 65%, depending on what that contract research is for, um, as well as supplies. So supply, supplies expense is a big factor for manufacturers specifically. So there are a lot of misconceptions on research and development. Um, I, a lot of people think that it's a stereotypical scientist in a laboratory with a lab coat. That isn't the case. A lot of what you're doing already probably qualifies for the credit, whether that be you're developing a new process in your manufacturing facility that's going to improve the quality or improve speed, you know, developing new products for customers that customers have specifically designed that you haven't done before. Uh, those are things that are co very common in research and development activity. And the big thing to know is that while this is a federal R&D tax credit, New York State through Excelsior Jobs Program has a credit available. So you would get up to 50% of the federal R&D credit. So to summarize, uh, you don't need lab coats, you don't need beakers, you don't need a doctorate's degree. Um, you also don't need an R&D uh, team, you could just have, be doing your manufacturing process, especially if you're designing uh, new pieces, specific pieces. Uh, if you are a manufacturer and you haven't explored the R&D tax credit, I suggest uh, that you do explore it because probably 90, 95% of manufacturers can uh, take advantage of it. They're doing some form of R&D specifically, it's usually engineering related uh, on the mechanical side or electrical side. And basically, you figure out the federal R&D tax credit. You get in, if you get into Excelsior, uh, it's a juicer on the federal R&D tax credit equal to one half of that tax credit. So uh, it could be even more valuable uh, to uh, manufacturers that are in Excelsior. Regarding non-qualified activities for research and development, this would not include anything um, incurred after the product hits commercial production. So once it's reached feasibility, research and development then ends. Um, surveys and studies, market research, those activities also are not qualified, uh, as well as any research involving the social sciences, arts, humanities. As I had mentioned before, it's 
key that the research is connected to the hard sciences. As I had mentioned before, the R&D credit is a wage-driven credit, so the majority of the qualified research expenses do come from wages. Um, typically, it's boxed when wages on the W-2 that you're paying the employees that are participating in the activities, um, as well as the contract research, which I mentioned before, depending on what that contract research is for. It's either 100%, 75%, or 65% of the cost. Supplies, as I had mentioned, is big in the manufacturing industry. Obviously, you are producing a tangible product, so therefore the supplies expense that's going into those prototypes or that first um, model or that first design that is, in fact, qualified as well. Great. Thanks, guys. The Obviously, the federal R&D credit and the uh, accompanying Empire State Development Excelsior R&D credit is one that uh, people don't know a lot about, and I wanted to spend a little time talking about it today. Um, so the slide you're seeing right now is a sample benefit schedule within the uh, the Excelsior Jobs Program. This is really showing what an actual company did receive for their commitment of 100 jobs over a five-year period. As you can see, the credits are spread over a 10-year period, when and that's how the company realizes them. So this company, and this is really focused on the jobs tax credit, which I'll talk about a little bit right after this slide, but I, I want to just draw your attention to the actual figures. So this company projected they'd create 40 jobs as of tax year 2019, and if they reach that, they are eligible for a little over $56,000 in fully refundable tax credits. The next year, they're up to 55 jobs, and the tax credits go up in tow, all the way up to their maximum number of their projected jobs in year five, 2023 at 100 and then those credits will continue as they maintain those 100 jobs each year paying that company over $140,000. Now I've mentioned and, and Corey and Kristen mentioned these tax credits are fully refundable. What does that mean? It is one of the best parts about this program because you don't need to have any New York State tax liability to realize the benefit. As Corey has already laid out most of the people listening to this webinar are manufacturers, and the likelihood is they won't have any tax liability, corporate tax liability, to New York State. Well, when tax credits are fully refundable and you have zero tax liability, those credits come back to your company in the form of a tax refund. That's cash. It's a check from New York State. It's a great way to augment your growth and to de-risk some of the uh, costs that come with expansion. Another thing I wanted to point out too here is uh, if there's any manufacturers listening in the audience that are actually S Corps, uh, you can be an S Corp for federal purposes, but we can turn you back into a C Corp for New York State purposes and you can have a 0% uh, tax rate on the retained earnings uh, as a New York State C Corp, but then still get these refundable tax credits. An excellent point, Corey. There's ways to uh, you know, maximize your benefits at state and federal levels, even when you're incorporated in a certain way as an S-Corp. So a little bit more on the jobs tax credit. This is really where the bulk of Excelsior benefits come in for the companies we're working with. And what makes, has the most influence is the number of jobs and the gross wages they pay. That's the, the program is discretionary. Um, and so it's not a straightforward calculation. There is a maximum benefit under law. Um, not every company, really very few companies get up to that maximum benefit, but there's a number of factors that ESD uh, weighs as they do their cost benefit analysis. But some key points to, to consider as you're thinking about what um, would qualify as new jobs under Excelsior, they must be direct hires. Contract work workers do not count. Um, so they, they must be W-2 workers. Net new jobs means new to New York State, not necessarily new to that company. Um, if a company has operations in multiple states and they're considering consolidating or moving some operations into New York State, those are considered net new jobs. Even if the same individual person continues working for the company, if they were working in another state like California and they move to the Buffalo Niagara region and work out of the facility or the new facility here, that is considered a net new job. 
And I do want to make a point that retained jobs of existing New York State companies may also qualify for Excelsior benefits if they are deemed at risk of leaving New York State. So here at Invest Buffalo Niagara, our primary mission is attracting uh, co new companies to the region, but we also work with companies that have existing operations and there is some competition with other locations. Maybe the company has operations in all 50 states or in 10 states and there's um, some sort of opportunity to grow and add lines, um, but that might mean that there's some jobs at risk of leaving the state. Those jobs may also qualify for benefits under the calculation. Um, it uh, really depends on each individual situation. So I'm going to throw it back over to Corey to talk about the as of right investment tax credit. You saw on a, a few slides ago that there is an investment tax credit that can be part of the Excelsior program, but there's another piece of New York State tax law that's as of right for the investment tax credit or ITC as we like to you know, attribute an acronym to just about everything uh, in economic development. But I, I'd really like Corey to spend some time talking about the as of right investment tax credit because it's one that people don't necessarily know about and can be extremely lucrative. So thank you, Alan. Uh, and, and I just wanted to point out that Alan uh, went over the four different tax credits quickly on the Excelsior Jobs Program, one of them being the investment tax credit, but we didn't have that highlighted because uh, it's usually not applicable to uh, manufacturers. If you are a manufacturer in New York State uh, and you apply to Excelsior, you could get an ITC of 2% uh, on your depreciable property that you place in the service. So uh, that's the key to trigger the, any ITC, whether it's the Excelsior ITC or the as of right uh, ITC for manufacturers in New York State is uh, placing a piece of depreciable property into service that's used directly in the manufacturing process. So that could actually be a building, and it's technically only supposed to be the portion of the building that is attributable to manufacturing, so you should carve out the bathrooms and the lunchroom. Mm -hmm. uh, and it can also be a, a, a equipment uh, that you capitalize and depreciate. Um, but if we're working with a manufacturer, we never ask for a investment tax credit from Excelsior because it's only 2%, where a manufacturer is going to get either a 4 or a 5% uh, investment tax credit, depending on whether it is, it, it'll get 4% uh, if it is a partnership or an S-corporation, and it'll get a 5% tax credit if it is a C-corp. Uh, and the nice thing about this tax credit, again, uh, just as with the Excelsior tax credit, is it can be refundable. It's not always refundable. If you've been in existence for more than five years, then it's a non-refundable tax credit. In existence in New York State Correct. for more than five years. Good point. So if you if you've been, exi been in existence for 20 years and you were in California and then you moved to New York State, the stock the clock starts ticking when you actually move into uh, into uh, New York State. And generally speaking, for the five-year period, you ignore tax short tax years. So if you burn a year because you incorporate on December 21st, it doesn't eat into your five years. Um, and, and this is important because if a lot of manufacturers end up being C-Corps in New York State, and uh, the a non-refundable tax credit would be worthless to them because they have a 0% tax rate. Uh, another thing that, that I see uh, missed with some manufacturers is uh, you might be placing uh, equipment, depreciable equipment into service that is used in your R&D process that we talked about with the federal R&D tax credit. And, and if so, we, we juice up the New York State investment tax credit from either 4% for flow through entities or 5% for C-Corps to 7% for uh, S-Corps and partnerships and 9% for uh, C-Corps. So if we can if we can carve out and say something's used in the R&D process, we can get an even bigger refund uh, from New York State in the form of a refundable tax credit. Uh, also, if you uh, say you aren't a C-Corporation, uh, you're an S-Corporation or a partnership, and you're looking at the investment tax credit, uh, that tax credit would then go through to your owners, it's called a flow-through entity, and show up on the personal return and reduce personal income taxes on the New York State return. And uh, if you increase your employment of anywhere from uh, one to two percent 
per year after you take the investment tax credit. There is a uh, add-on credit for the next two years uh, called the Employment Incentive Credit. It's real easy to get because all you got to do is increase it by one or two percent, uh, and that could juice up the ITC. Uh, that's four uh, percent. I think it's almost double it, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, to a total credit of 8% over the three-year period. Uh, but that's only really available to manufacturers that are not C-corporations because of, that is a non-refundable tax credit. So C-corps at a 0% tax rates wouldn't get any benefit from it. This next slide is how is a new business to New York State defined so that we can see if the ITC would really be refundable at whatever percentage they end up at as uh, depending on their corporate uh, structure. Yep. So this is the five-year period that we were talking about. Um, it, if it's a new corporation, it's pretty easy. If it's moving to uh, New York State, um, then uh, they can't be substantially similar to another an old business. So this kind of there's an old program uh, that got a lot of bad publicity, and they don't allow you to just start a new uh, entity. It was called shirt changing. Uh, and dump the old business into the new business, get a new AIM and start the benefit period over. So I, I mentioned here, uh, I talked about this slide a little bit already, uh, and this is what does quali what qualifies a, a for an ITC, and it's basically depreciable property. It has to be over a uh, useful life of over three years. Uh, so mainly what that excludes would be software. So any software that you uh, purchase off the shelf and use in your business is usually depreciated over three years, so it excludes that. Must be acquired by purchase, uh, constructed or reconstructed. And one, if you dig into the regulations enough here, uh, one thing that you'll go, you'll find is that the purchase has to be from a unrelated party. So if you're, what, a, a, a tricky thing is I, I've seen, um, Say you have a large business in Canada or another country, and you're thinking about expanding to the United States. A lot of times, the um, money isn't in the new entity to buy the equipment or make the down payment. Uh, so if that's true, and the money comes from the mothership in Canada, uh, you want to make sure that invoice uh, for the purchase of the equipment is actually in the name of the U.S. company once it gets up and running. Because if you're ever audited, you don't want to say that the mother company in Canada purchased it and you purchase it from a related party because if you get a smart enough auditor, they can try and deny that tax credit. So that's something uh, that, that is a pitfall that I've seen um, uh, that tripped up people in the past. So here's just uh, some items that qualifying property does not include, uh, property that's leased to others, uh, retail equipment, office furniture, office equipment, uh, so, I, and I think I kind of touched on this before is um, if you pay $10 million for a building, I wouldn't take an investment tax credit on $10 million. It's probably more around, I don't know, $975,000 because you have to carve out uh, administrative offices, bathrooms, and lunch rooms. And I usually do that by uh, square footage. Uh, and then electricity generating equipment also does not qualify. All right, excellent. As you heard from the CPA's mouth themselves, uh, there is a lot of complexity that comes with it when you really are seeing which different programs you are eligible for. Um, and it really, there are a lot of programs that are out there. So I'm gonna bring us back to the hypothetical projects we laid out at the beginning and talk through a little bit about how these projects would be eligible and take advantage of the programs we were just talking about, as well as a, a, a few others. Um, I will mention right now, this webinar is, should not be considered comprehensive in the least. We are covering those programs that we feel and that through our experience have been most advantageous and most commonly applicable. Um, but there are myriad other programs that are out there and that companies can take advantage of. They are really well summarized in the incentives guide that we've created in the newly updated version, which will be emailed to you after the conclusion of this webinar. So. Going back to our large project, um, new construction of the facility, 200,000 square foot facility, projected to create 200 new jobs. This is gonna be a big potential Excelsior award with 200 jobs at $50,000 a year. Uh, as you saw um, in that sample schedule of benefits, the company that projected to create 100 
jobs, uh, was eligible for up to $1.2 million in refundable tax credits. It's not a straight calculation. As I mentioned, it is a discretionary program, but it's very likely that this company would be eligible for somewhere uh, in the range of $2 million or maybe a little bit more in tax credits over several over that 10-year period. Um, but their capital investments will be significant. We spent a lot of time talking about that uh, the ITC, the investment tax credit, a lot of these costs are eligible for um, for tax credits. And if they're considered a new business to New York State, as we discussed, many of those tax credits would be fully refundable as well. So um, the expenditures on the production equipment, the expenditures on the 15 million on the new construction, um, when you carve out those items or those parts of the building, as Corey said, the bathrooms aren't directly used in manufacturing, so those wouldn't count. But the majority, vast majority of that cost, if it's primarily a manufacturing facility, uh, would would count. Um, so, and then we've got a, a big power demand, um, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. Let's look at our small and medium-sized company again. Here, 25 new jobs. Again, this is going to qualify for a nice incentive where it's going to make it that much more attractive to do business here in New York State, in the Buffalo Niagara region. Um, New York State would really come in with a strong offer for a company like this. As Corey mentioned, manufacturing is a highly targeted industry, one in which we're set up for success through our infrastructure, through our investments in workforce training and our colleges and universities. So um, the jobs tax credit would be you know, strongly applied to those 25 new jobs at 50,000 a year. And still, um, this company would have a nice return on their um, investment tax credit as well. One, just one, I wanted to add one thing here because this has been going through my mind since we went through the two hypothetical projects is sometimes if you get a large project uh, such as the 200 new jobs, he thinks that th down the road they're going to create 200 new jobs, but they're like, you know, I really don't know whether I want to publicize that commitment. Uh, if you go to the next slide, sometimes what we can do is we can commit to 25 new jobs and get an Excelsior award. And then three or four years down the road, if we're at 15 or 20 jobs and we think things are going well, and now we think the 200 jo total jobs are uh, a much more likely reality, we can actually layer a second Excelsior offer on top of that 20, those 25 jobs and ask for an Excelsior award on the additional 175 jobs. So uh, I have seen it, individuals, companies, projects kind of hesitant to make that huge commitment. And, and so you can go into some sort of phased agreement, agreement with Empire State Development uh, to kind of take the pressure off and, and the headlines are a little lower and there's less spotlight on it because business happens and sometimes things take a little longer to, to come to fruition than uh, one might think in the projection stages. Thanks, Corey. So I want to spend a couple minutes on um, energy incentives and the, the one that is most unique and different for our region here in Western New York is low cost hydropower through the New York Power Authority. So uh, the Niagara Power Project located just a, a couple miles north of the Niagara Gorge from Niagara Falls produces a ton of clean green hydropower and a portion of that uh, 695 megawatts to be exact is by law, uh, allocated for economic development purposes within the 30 mile radius of that operation, as well as a carve out for um, economic development in Chautauqua County as well. So this program really comes into play for our large project example, where they are projecting a peak demand of five megawatts uh, and a three shift operation where, the, where they will have a high load factor. Um, load factor is how uh, often you're peaking your peaks and valleys in your electrical demand. And so a company operating three shifts uh, with depending on their equipment and things like that could have a higher load factor. And they're primely positioned to take to get some of the lowest power rates anywhere in the United States um, through this NIPA program. It's one that has really set us apart and gotten us in the game for a lot of projects where companies are looking at their uh, expenditures and seeing power as one of their top three or top five expenditures. More thing on the energy incentives. Uh, if we go back to the 25 job um, project, 
even though they don't have a high power demand, uh, under Excelsior, once you get your first tax credit uh, certificate, uh, if you've ever seen an electrical bill, it is broken out into three parts. The Excelsior Jobs Program will allow you to get a 30% discount on your delivery portion. So even though we can't go after the NIFA power because we're not big enough, there still are energy incentives uh, that you can go after even under Excelsior. And that and that's an automatic one. Like you yep. said, Corey, if you're in good standing in the Excelsior Jobs Program and you have your Excelsior certificate in hand, you just need to contact your account manager at your electric or natural gas utility um, and they will get you into that reduced rate category. Thanks so much. No problem. So the Brownfield Cleanup Program, um, we don't have a lot of time to spend on this. What I really want to make sure people are aware of is that um, the Brownfield Cleanup Program is not just for those really ambitious companies who say, I'm going to take a highly contaminated site and I'm going to clean it up myself. There are sites here in the Buffalo Niagara region where um, the current owner or a previous owner has taken the initiative to get this site into the state's voluntary brownfield cleanup program and done some or all of the cleanup. Uh, but by getting into that program, there are some potentially really lucrative incentives that are available for companies that would construct new facilities and, and create jobs on those sites. So one that, that I will note here, um, it's not certainly not the only brownfield site, but the Bethlehem Steel, former Bethlehem Steel site in Lackawanna, just south of the city of Buffalo. Um, a, a portion of that has been uh, remediated and cleaned up and is owned by the ILDC, the uh, Industrial Land Development Corp, a subsidiary uh, or affiliate organization of the Erie County Industrial Development Agency. They've gotten this primed and ready, and this site has uh, all the infrastructure in place from a former industrial use, and the tax credits that are tied to the site are even more significant than those we have discussed before. Um, they could be up to 20% of, of expenditures that would include construction of your building and certain equipment even that would be part of that operation as well. So um, for companies that are look at, that are projecting to need to create, uh, to build a new building, um, this is a great program to consider. Um, we're running a bit low on time and I really wanna make sure we have time for some questions that have come in. There's the, the WOTC, the Workforce Opportunity Tax Credit um, at the federal level. It's for targeted employees. It's administered through the State Department of Labor. Um, and this is one of these programs where you actually can go after it after the fact. You file for it after you've hired one of these targeted employees and they can um, really reduce the rate and the, the cost of training uh, during your, uh, your new hires uh, training period. Um, so thank you, Alan, Kristen, Corey, for your expertise today. Um, we hope that our audience has had the opportunity to see what is available in the Buffalo Niagara region, uh, get a sense of how you can fit in if you're looking to grow your business, as well as the experts that we have here. We just kind of touched on their expertise, but if you were to reach out to us, we can connect you with partners like Clumston. Uh, McCormick or other partners that you may need along the process. So we're going to go ahead and take some time for questions and I'll give you a few minutes to submit those. I do know we have a handful or so of them. Invest Buffalo Niagara has been in existence for 20 years now and has helped 390 plus businesses over those years expand to the Buffalo Niagara region. If now's the time for your business to consider an expansion, where do you start? You can reach out as I mentioned to us. We will work confidentially and free of charge and set up meetings uh, with Did you partners, hear that? free of charge. <laughs> <laughs> we can identify real estate opportunities. We can walk you through this incentives process all the way, and we truly assist from start to finish. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, you will receive an email follow up with us, um, and it will provide you our latest incentives guide. In addition, in the meantime, you can go to our website, buffaloniagara.org, um, where we have specific industry content tools that you can use, guides, brochures, and you can even sign up for our manufacturing email and stay connected with us. So let's take a look at a few questions then that we do have today. The first one, how long does the application process take for these incentives? I'll take this one, Sarah. So it varies based on the program, but um, the, the program we've talked about the most here is the Excelsior Jobs Program, and actually it is one of the most efficient application processes 
of any incentive program that that I've seen. I look across the st across the country at different programs. The application itself is a is in the form of a worksheet that's only three pages long. Um, really, if you've thought through and have a, a solid business plan of what your expansion project looks like, it wouldn't take you much longer than an hour to fill out. Um, our business development staff here, myself and my teammates, um, are ready to help walk you through it, answer questions about it. But once you finish that project information worksheet and submit it to uh, a, a uh, project manager at Empire State Development, you would likely have your incentive offer in about a month's time, um, if not even a little sooner. It's really quite efficient. They can turn it around and you'll know exactly what your specific incentive offer is for your project quite quickly. And um, then you just sign it and you are ready to ready to move forward with the next phase of, of your project as you consider Buffalo Niagara versus other regions. We have a couple questions about the minimum job levels. So are the five job minimums required to fall into the R&D category? So it depends on what um, category this your particular project would fall into. So if um, if you're a manufacturing company, no, you don't have to do R&D to qualify for manufacturing uh, for the jobs tax credits under Excelsior. You just have to be doing manufacturing. Now there are is another category, scientific R&D, that if your operation is not even doing manufacturing but is only engaging in scientific R&D, you also qualify. And that job minimum happens to also be uh, only five jobs. So um, it can definitely be either or, but if you're in manufacturing, you can also uh, add additional tax credits um, as Kristen had laid out by, uh, if you qualify for the federal R&D tax credit, which New York State will then match up to 50%. Generally speaking, I have seen manufacturers be a slam dunk here. The only place I've seen any issues is with brewers. Uh, brewers are consider considered manufacturers, but they usually come with a tap room as well. And sometimes the total employment is skewed towards the tap room and the restaurant at the beginning until the production picks up. Uh, so that's the only place I've seen a problem with what type of job it is when you're a manufacturer. All right. On the same topic, what happens if I do not meet the job numbers by the scheduled dates? So another great aspect of the Excelsior Jobs Program is it is totally performance-based. Um, so there's really no uh, major risk involved. If you're looking like you're going to fall short of your job creation projections, it's really it, the onus is on the company to raise your hand, reach out to your uh, account representative within Empire State Development, let them know that, hey, you know, it looks like we're going to fall short this year. Here's why. We lost a key account. You know, or maybe you know the the economy you know shifted in this direction. Um, you know, something happened, a business reason, uh, and and you explain that, and they will. Um, they may not shift your entire schedule that year if it's just the first year. Your benefit will certainly be prorated. You will not get benefit for jobs that you did not create, um, but you will not be punished for any uh, credits you previously received. So if in years one through three, you're spot on your numbers, but you had a projected a big jump in year four and you're not going to hit that, those credits you earned in years one through three are never at risk because you employed those people in those years. Um, so it, it's really a, a pretty low risk proposition for the company. Okay. Um, what is the difference between a C-Corp versus an S-Corp? I know you started touching on that, but if you can dive into that a little deeper. Um, I can take that. So a C corporation is not a pass through. So a C corporation is essentially, a lot of people refer to it as that double taxation. So if you want to get money out of the corporation, you're not only being taxed at a corporate rate, but then those dividends would also be taxed. An S corporation is actually a flow through entity. So rather than being taxed at an entity level, the S corporation itself spits out what's called a schedule K1, which goes to the individual. So the shareholders of that S corporation and the, that income from that S corporation is then taxed at the individual level as opposed to the entity level. So from a high level standpoint, your biggest difference between a C corp and an S corp is that the C corp is taxed at the entity level, whereas the S corporation, all of that activity flows through to the shareholder level. Thanks, Chris. And I just want to add in, because um, it looks like it was a, a Canadian uh, listener who asked that question. 
one of the big things at Invest Buffalo Niagara that we uh, offer is um, pretty full service cross-border due diligence assistance. So uh, we work with a ton of Canadian companies that are expanding into the U.S. for the first time. And this question of how do I incorporate, what form do I take, is one of the first ones to address. And it's one that um, has a lot of different moving pieces, both from a tax and accounting perspective, as Kristen was really just laying out, but also from a, a legal perspective. So it's uh, often a conversation with both uh, U.S.-based legal counsel and uh, tax accountants, and it's uh, it's not overly complicated, but it's a, a an item that you certainly want to address and not just pick a random uh, type of corporation because you heard your neighbor formed an LLC and that's what you want to go with. So there's a lot of different nuances there, and, and the team at Invest Buffalo Niagara is here to help walk you through them uh, and bring in the right experts for each one. Okay, we have another time frame question here. So once approved for the Excelsior program, how long can you wait until you start tapping into it, assuming you apply prior to setting up shop? Good question. And so I'm actually going to um, jump to the last part of the question first. You have to apply before setting up shop. That is a really important piece of most of what we've talked about today and with most economic development incentives, except for something that's as of right. We talked about different as of right incentives that you get just by performing uh, whatever that operation is. For most economic development incentives, they are incentives to do something, not rewards for having done something. So if you set up shop and hire 25 people like we had on our medium sized project and then go to New York State and say, hey, I hired 25 people. You got any incentives for me? They're going to say, well, you hired 25 people. Thank you. Welcome to New York State. We're really happy you're here. But you're already here and you've done it. You've shown that you're moving forward and you hired these people. It's really important that you um, address these items and, and look at what incentive programs you would be eligible for before you move forward. Now to the first part of the question, once approved for the Excelsior program, how long can you wait? It really depends on what you project out. So if you are constructing a new building, well, your uh, hiring isn't going to commence. Uh, your permanent hiring isn't likely to commence until after the building is, is completed. So that may be a, you know, an 8, 12, 24 month process, depending on the complexity and size of that building. Um, but it's really, you know, up, up to you. You can apply today get approved and projecting that you're going to start in 2020. If you hit a delay um, and you realize it's really not going to happen until 2021, again, you raise your hand, talk to ESD. Um, if the parameters are pretty much the same, it's just a, t a timing change, they uh, will more often than not be flexible with you and just shift your benefits ahead one year and you'd start taking them in the year you project to hit that minimum jobs threshold. Okay, one more question. How does New York State calculate corporate income tax liability when a company is operating and selling in multiple states? So for a C corporation, uh, New York State is a uh, one factor um, computation. And that means if you're a C corporation, you take a look at where your goods end up. So if they're shipped to a state, those sales are, are sourced to that state. So generally speaking, if your New York state income tax is only based on the percentage of, of sales that are actually shipped to New York state. So if you ship all of your goods outside of New York state, then you have no uh, income tax in New York state, but you got to, even if you did, you have a 0% tax rate as a C corp anyways. For an S corporation, it's the same allocation factor. Uh, it is based on sales. Uh, but if you are a New York State resident that is an owner of an S corporation, all of your income tax, all of your income is taxed by New York State. Anyways, a partnership is actually a three-factor uh, allocation. If, so if you're a partnership that's a manufacturer, you look at the percentage of your sales inside and outside of New York State, the amount of wages inside and outside of New York State, and then also your plant property equipment inside and outside of New York State. So the answer to the question depends on the type of entity you are first, and then there's an allocation method. Okay. It looks like we've covered all of our questions today, and we will double check and see if we've missed anyone, and we will follow up. Um, you're welcome to follow up with our presenters today. Um, I appreciate your time uh, being on the presentation, and Alan, Corey, and Kristen, I appreciate your expertise. Have a great day, everyone.